How's it going, everybody? Thanks for coming today. My name is Justin Beckwith. I'm going to be talking about uh, Node.js, talking about Google, and a lot of the things that we're doing at Google to try to make it a better place for Node.js developers. Oh, and of course, we're going to talk about just a little bit of magic along the way. And no. OK, cool. All right, so before we get into some of this stuff, you know, why, I, I want to talk a little bit about why at Google we care about Node.js. You know, why are we here at Node Interactive? Why are we at Node Summit? Earlier this year, we joined the Node.js Foundation. Uh, another big thing we've been doing is a lot of contributions into V8 and into Node.js Core to make it a better platform for Node developers. But really what this all comes down to, and it sounds a little corny, but we believe in the web. As much as any other company out there, Google was founded on the idea that we exist on the web. We're all there together. And ultimately, we want to make it a better platform for everyone to come build JavaScript-based applications. And this means tooling at development time. It means tooling once you're running in production. It means tooling to help you get into production. And really, when, when you look at what we've been doing for the last you know, 10, 15 years, and the number of front-end apps, we're all the way up to nearly two and a half billion lines of JavaScript in our repository. So all of the tooling that we need, that we need to go build for ourselves, we want to make it so everyone else can go use this as well. Another one of the issues that we care about deeply is running great code in production. So when you want to run an application in production, when you do it at a small scale, that's difficult enough to get set up. Doing it at a kind of Google sort of scale is pretty difficult in general. It's really hard. And we want everyone to be able to benefit from the tools we have locally and from some of the tools that we're doing in the cloud, things like Kubernetes for orchestrating Docker containers, things like some of our debugging and tracing and analysis tools that we're going to need a chance to take a look at here in a little bit. Part of running inside of Google Cloud, the general idea is that you can pick up your application, you write it in a particular way. Typically, uh, we, we like to run things in Docker containers is the way that we like to do it. And then you can run your app inside of Google's data centers, right along uh, applications like Gmail, Search, Maps, all the sorts of apps you've been using for some time. And we isolate everything, and you can run it on our infrastructure. So this isn't new. You know, we've had virtual machines for a long time. We've had cloud for a long time. When I say making magic, Really, you know, what am I talking about? And what it comes down to is when we build our client side, our user-facing applications, today we're getting asked to do a lot more than we used to get asked to do. We're, asking, we're getting asked to do more with DevOps. If we're building our applications, now we're getting asked to manage them in the cloud. And then we're getting asked to do more in terms of the richness of our applications and how our users interact with them. We're getting asked to look at pictures like this and figure out, is this, what is this a picture of? What kind of animal is it? Am I looking at grass? Does this have sensitive information in it? Is there text in it? We're getting asked to listen to audio and figure out what was the user trying to say to us? I think most of us today in the room, you know, we, we use our phones, talk to Siri, OK Google, and it's expected that I can talk to my device and have it understand what I was trying to say. After we have the audio, after we have those images, we're expected to be able to draw user intent and meaning from the data that we got out of that. And this is a huge challenge for anyone that's tried to step up and build these kinds of applications. And it's a big problem we've been trying to solve at Google for a number, number of years. These are the types of apps that are what we need to go build next. We look at things like the Echo, the Google Home, OK Google. The expectation is that when users interact with our apps, they want to do it in a natural way, using natural languages. We want to deal in images, videos, sound, not direct input with thumbs, unless that's what you still want to do. So to help make this easier, part of what we started to do is expose our, what we call our cloud machine learning APIs. And essentially, these are APIs that expose technology we've been building in a number of years for our own products, for things like Google Translate, Google Photos, Inbox, and exposing those as APIs that you can pick up and you can start using with pre-trained ML models. If you want to go down and you want to get deep into machine learning, we have a number of tools that make that easier with our cloud machine learning platform. TensorFlow is a good thing to go check out. But the idea with these APIs is that if you come up and you have a simple task where you just want to look at that picture and figure out what's in it, is there text, you want to analyze speech, they're, they're tailored for that specific type of workload. The whole idea is that we want to make building, we want to make machine learning stuff easier because today it's just way too hard to pick up and get started with on your own. And you think about it, you know, if we had these kinds of tools, you know, it used to be you'd have to spend years doing research to be able to do that kind of image analysis or years doing research to do speech transcription. With these kinds of APIs, we could go out there and we could build the next set of apps that are going to go out and change the world. I use them to build an app about my cat. Uh, so that actually is my cat. 
Getting back a little bit to why Google cares. Uh, our core mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally ac uh, accessible and useful. And for me, this means asking questions. And they can be serious questions, or they can be kind of silly questions, or they can be arguments that you had with a coworker who sits next to you. And every time I give this talk, my coworker John feels a little bit bad because I prove him wrong with data. So my very, very important question to go ask is, which animals are cuter, dogs or cats? You know, very important. And where can we find the kind of data to help us answer those sorts of questions? Can we get quantifiable, you know, concrete data to help back up my assertion? My assertion is that dogs are cuter, by the way. And of course, I decided when you want to go to a place where, you know, the great thinkers of our time get together and ask the great questions, of course, I went to Reddit. In this specific case, I decided to go to r slash awe, pretty much like the home base for cute pictures of animals, right? And since I was, uh, I was on the job, this is during work time, tr I was trying to organize the world's information to make it accessible, so I figured it was okay to, to build this app at work. Uh, Microservice-style architecture um, running on App Engine. We have a front end that's serving the, uh, the, the front end content, a back end that's doing the processing. Going to r slash awe, out to Reddit, downloading all the pictures of dogs and cats for a couple of days, and then processing them with the Cloud Vision API to figure out if it was a dog or if it was a cat. So if there are more dogs, then we know that I was right. If there are more cats on the front page, then I know I'm wrong. We can do it. So to do this, I use the Google Cloud Vision API. And the idea behind this API is that you feed it images, and those can be locally or in cloud storage. I can extract text via OCR. I can do generic label analysis and just say, tell me what you think is in the picture based on the pre-trained model. We can identify not safe for work type content, which was very important when I prepared for this talk because I don't want to get fired. Um, we can detect things like logos, landmarks, all that kind of cool stuff, and we're going to see some of this code in a bit. So this is enough talk. Let's actually go and run the demo. So this is Cloud Cats. So right now what's happening is that we're going out to reddit.com. We're going to the first three pages of r slash aw. I'm taking, downloading all of the pictures and starting to classify them, figure out is it a dog, is it a cat, is it neither? Is it both? And so far, what it looks like is happening, this is all real time, by the way. You can go to Reddit and see these images if you want to check it out. We have dogs coming out to a bit of an early lead, but cats are catching up. Got a cat with a funny thing on its head. Crazy looking cat. Oh no, I might be getting wrong. There are more cats right now. Um, I think we misclassified a handful of baby turtles. Sometimes that will happen. Um, it's, not, it's not perfect. We all make mistakes. So... <laughs> Uh, Christmas cat, we've got a sweater dog, and there we have it. Dogs win. <laughs> Organizing the world's information, people. It's what they pay me to do at Google. So if you want to go try this out yourself, we make the Cloud Vision API accessible and a, lot of the, a few of the others that we're going to take a look at today uh, using the Google Cloud NPM module. And this is just one of the many NPM modules we have out there that we've started to build over the last couple of years that are exposing our services. Uh, using the API is actually pretty, pretty simple. You pretty much pass it, upload it, pass it a path to an image locally. Say, detect labels is what I used in this case because I didn't want to do all the other analysis. I wanted to keep it fairly fast. And it will really just return a list of labels. And in my case, it would return dog, cat, canine, golden retriever, uh, these kinds, uh, this kind of information. It's pretty easy to pick up and start using. So we got our first answer, dogs. So let's move on to the next great question that we want to go answer. What is the happiest subreddit on the front page? You know, I'm a real positive guy. I don't like negativity. In the last few weeks on the internet, there's been a little negativity and a few things I've wanted to avoid. And so I wanted to create my own curated set of subreddits based on what was going to make me the happiest. And I decided this is a good, this is a good thing for Google to go figure out. You know, this is a good machine learning task. So I went out, took the top 50 subreddits. These are all the ones that are on the front page. And if you haven't used Reddit, a subreddit is like a forum where you can go discuss various topics. And I took all of them, downloaded the first, um, the first four pages of content, all of the comments from the first four pages, uh, went down into various levels of depth, brought that all locally, and analyzed 170,000 comments. Uh, this was data from about a week ago uh, that we went so that we could do some analysis on it. And if you want to see the source code for how I did this analysis, the link to the GitHub page is right there. You can go check it out. So to parse it and to figure out if it was happy or not, I used the Google Cloud Natural Language API. Now, this API is capable of doing a lot of things. It can extract meaning, structure, people, places. What I used it for specifically was the sentiment analysis API that was baked inside of it. 
So using the NLP API for sentiment, kind of similar to what you saw with the Vision API, you just import the module, use the language API, and then really just pass it a string and say detect sentiment. And so what I did after I processed all these records, I needed some place to store it. So 170,000 comments, a lot of processing, I decided to store the data in BigQuery to do the analysis. So BigQuery is Google's hosted data warehouse solution. Uh, the idea is that you can stream large, large, large amounts of data into it and then use standard SQL to query over top of it. If you're going to do any kind of large-scale data analysis, it's a great tool. And one of my favorite things, you can find another, another one of the talks that I've given in the past, we have these things called public data sets. So we actually have all of GitHub loaded into BigQuery, and you can go do really interesting queries over that, or queries over all the content of Hacker News, or other more useful things like census data or uh, disease data. Lots of cool stuff out there to go play with. But I'm using it to figure out the happiest place on the internet. So once I had all of this content, uh, again, I mentioned it's standard SQL to query over it. I'm using the polarity and the magnitude. These are the two things that come back from the natural language API when you want to detect sentiment. And they tell you polarity is, was it, was it happy, was it sad? And magnitude is the degree to which it was happy or sad, the extremeness of that emotion. A very crude way to combine those to figure out general happiness is just multiply them together. Uh, so I grabbed all of those, uh, ordered by descending, trying to find the happiest subreddit. And the results, listen to this, and music, and of course Photoshop battles, because who doesn't like a good, a good Photoshop battle? And so I found the happiest things that I could do when I was on Reddit after, after the election, if I wanted to stay happy, was just completely focus on music-focused subreddits. And I actually did trim mine down based on the results. So that was just the top five results. What if we want to see a better visualization of this data? Because we did analyze 50 subreddits. To do that, I use Google Data Studio, and really this is just a nice dashboarding tool that like, lets me create reports from things like BigQuery, if you have data in Google Sheets, MySQL, Analytics, if you're using Google Analytics for your front end, you can dump it into this and create nice looking reports. And so I just did that real quickly, and I got this kind of interesting analysis of the happiness for the various subreddits, and you can see, listen to this is actually twice as happy as the next subreddit down. Um, and you can see pretty quickly when it levels out, the place you want to stay away from, if you want to stay happy, stay away from announcements, explain it like I'm five, and world news. World news is a terrible place. Don't go there. Um, and today I learned was the most meh. <laughs> it was like nice and in the middle. So the answer that I got is uh, stick to the music-focused subreddits. Nobody who's listening to good music is angry with the world. That's what I learned. All right, so now getting into perhaps the hardest question for us to go solve, and maybe a little bit of a harder one that we can't solve with machine learning, but why isn't my code working? Uh, this was something I had to ask as I went through preparing for this talk several times, and I was trying to build some of these demos. And this gets into one of the ways where we're trying to help make it easier to build and maintain Node.js applications, both locally and in cloud. So just to kind of show some of this off, what I'm going to do is show this application that I've got running locally that uses the Cloud Vision API. Um, I'm running it on, you see I'm running on localhost. And I'm just going to take a quick picture. And what I'm doing is feeding this through the Vision API, and it's going to try to figure out what I'm doing. And look, it detected that I'm doing a speech. That's actually pretty cool. I haven't seen that one before. And then it found my face, and we can actually go deeper with that and figure out what's going on, like what parts of my facial features are available. But one of the cool things that we started to do is take and connect the development tools we have inside of Chrome for debugging and connect those directly with what you're able to do with your Node.js application. So you can see here, it detected that I'm actually running a node process, and I can directly now connect to that process and debug my, both my front end and back end code together inside of Chrome. So this is the application using the Vision API. I'm just going to come in, and just like I would do normally for front-end development, set a breakpoint, take another picture. Let's get a water bottle. It may detect it. It may not. We'll see how it goes. And we're able to hit our breakpoint and introspect all the interesting things that are happening. It found my face. It got five labels this time. It thought I had alcohol. <laughs> so it's also, it's, also a, um, it's also a predictor of future things that are happening. So in, in that case, it's actually correct. <laughs> And we can do local debugging using Chrome DevTools uh, to dig into our backend processes. So this is all well and good for local, but what if you have this application out running in production? Same kind of thing. What am I going to take a picture of now? Let's do this thing. I have no idea what it's going to say that is. So this time you can see, uh, it's going to pick up a few of those. What if I, what if I want to figure out and I want to say, something's going wrong in prod. How do I debug this without affecting all of my users? 
One of the new things that we put out there is called Google Cloud Stack Driver Debugger. And this is a passive debugger that actually lets you capture state of your app at runtime without affecting perf. So I'm just going to come down, find the exact same breakpoint. We're going to go ahead and run this, run this one more time. The last picture I'm going to take. And you can see this is going to complete. It's going to finish. It didn't affect performance. It still found my face, my facial hair, and the fact that I'm giving a speech. But you can see we just hit the breakpoint, and it took a snapshot of the current state of all of my variables in production. I could also do this with a conditional breakpoint if I know there's some impossible condition that causes a blow up in my app. And then I can come in, look through the state of all my local variables, find my face, find landmarks, labels, even go as deep as figuring out, am I happy? Am I sad? What's the position of my ears, my eyes, my forehead? All this cool stuff. But the bigger point is that I can now do this in prod without affecting a performance. I can debug on the client and debug on, in production on the server. So everything I just talked about is, uh, there, most of it's open source. You can find the Docker images we use on App Engine for our runtime, the API client, the NPM modules. Uh, all of this stuff is out on GitHub, so please go check it out. If you want to see the specific sources for any of these demos um, or any more documentation on the ML APIs, they're all here. Uh, go learn more, and thank you. <laughs>